listening to the Reformand Initiative podcast, where we analyze and discuss Roman Catholic theology and practice from an evangelical perspective. My name is Clay Kennard. I'm the communications director for the Reformand Initiative, and I'm joined once again here in the city center of Rome with our associate director, Reed Carr. Reed, how are you doing today? Doing great, Clay. Thank you. Good. And we're actually joined today with a very special guest, a good friend and a dear brother by the name of Mark Gilbert. Mark Gilbert works for a ministry called Certainty for Eternity, which is an organization that was established to help churches share the gospel with people from a Roman Catholic background. Uh, As we'll hear, Mark grew up as a committed Roman Catholic. But despite this, he didn't ever hear the gospel until he started university. Mark had trained as a doctor before retraining as a minister and has served in the Anglican churches in Sydney since 2000. He currently works as a chaplain on the Northern Beaches. And Mark has published a number of resources with Matthias Media to help people share the good news about Jesus with people from a Roman Catholic background. Uh, Of those works are the books, including The God Who Saves, The Road Once Traveled, and stepping out in faith. Uh, Additionally, Mark is a faculty member with our Rome Scholars and Leaders Network, which is kind of the flagship conference hosted by the Reformand Initiative every June in the city of Rome. Unfortunately, due to uh, COVID, we've had to postpone that the last two summers, but we are looking forward to the day where we will be together once again with Mark, who always helps us understand how we can approach Roman Catholics with the gospel. Mark, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Clay, it's wonderful to be with you. I'd love to see you face to face, but uh, this is almost the next best thing. It is. And we're we're super grateful that you're here with us today. And uh, we really believe this is going to be a very helpful and practical episode for our listeners, especially those who we have heard from that often talk about um, their desire to share the gospel and to engage their Roman Catholic friends and family members with the gospel of grace uh, and the biblical gospel. And so uh, we couldn't think of anyone better than you to invite onto our podcast today. So before we get started into answering those questions on how we engage Roman Catholics with the gospel, would you take some time to share with us uh, a brief version of your testimony? Uh, I'd love to, Clay. And I, I just want to commend what you guys are doing because. It is hard to find information about Roman Catholicism um, as an evangelical, and um, in some ways that, that's a bit surprising given that, um, according to Vatican figures, they make up 1.3 billion people uh, in the world, and most people have got a Roman Catholic friend or family or neighbour. Certainly in the city I come from, Sydney, um, one in almost one in three people are Roman Catholic, which means that uh, there's a pretty good chance that the person living next door to you is from a Roman Catholic background. Yeah, I, I grew up here. Um, I've always lived in, uh, in the northern beaches of, of Sydney, Australia. Um, I grew up in a Catholic family uh, that was committed. We went to Mass every Sunday, and I, I could probably count on one hand the number of times I, I missed Mass before I was 18. I went to a Catholic primary school and Catholic secondary school, and one rainy day I worked out that I'd had 1,100 religious education classes from kindergarten right through to my final years at school. Um, I really enjoyed growing up Roman Catholic. It was terrific. Um, There were a lot of good things about it. Uh, Growing up um, in um, an organisation that that was worldwide, um, that my, my parents belonged to, that you know, all the kids in my school um, belong to and, and their parents because basically in Sydney, um, almost everyone that goes to a Catholic school has a, has a Catholic background. Um, it was very secure. Um, yeah, growing up believing in God. Um, yeah, believing that Jesus was God. Um, having the church right next to the school. Uh, when I grew up, um, I, I had a a bit of a, a uh, an affliction called alopecia and my hair would fall out and grow back in various various ways and I had a bit of a hard time as a kid so being able to nick into the church and and, and pray was uh, w- w- was a really good thing um when I ran away from uh, home as an eight-year-old uh, I ran to the Catholic church and stayed in the church for an hour or two before I got cold and tired and hungry and went back home and apologized um you know, a lot of good things growing up Catholic. 
Trouble was, though, I never heard the gospel. Um, even being very involved in all of the Catholic education that I had, when I got to university, my understanding of God was that um, if I was good enough, I would get to heaven. Uh, in my first couple of weeks at university studying medicine, um, I met a couple of guys who um, were Christians. Now, I'd never really met or spoke to people that weren't Catholic that called themselves Christians. So I was quite curious to meet them. And I, I actually, I'd actually observed when I could see that they're actually living uh, in a way that I, I aspired to because I, I knew how I should live as a Catholic and these guys were actually doing it. Um, so I was curious. Um, and they asked me two questions that changed my life. The first question was, what do you believe? And like I said, after quite a few classes on Roman Catholicism and growing up as a committed Catholic, I give them a pretty reasonable answer. And then they asked me, why do you believe that? And as a first-year med student, I felt really uncomfortable with my answer. My answer was, well, that's what the priest says. And I felt that I should be able to give a better answer than that. But not to be undone, I asked my two Protestant friends what they believed, and I think about 80% of what they said I, I agreed with. And then I asked them why did they believe that? And they were able to open up their Bibles and show me a couple of spots from the Bible why they believed what they did. Now, as a good Catholic, I was absolutely certain that everything in the Bible would back up everything that I'd been taught as a Roman Catholic. I just didn't know it very well. So I decided to join a Bible study group to help these nice young Protestant men uh, find out why I was right and they were wrong. Um, and that began uh, my, my time of uh, reading the Bible for myself, and uh, it was wonderful. I really loved the Bible studies that they did. Um, they, were, they were thoughtful and engaging and made sense. And the thing that really struck me that I'd never picked up growing up in the Catholic Church was that God saves people who don't deserve it without their help. I always thought God saved people um, if they were good enough, but in almost every page of the Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, you see God saving people who don't deserve it without their help. And that was a revelation for me because as a Catholic, I wasn't quite sure where things were heading between me and God. On a good day, I'd think, yep, I'm going to heaven. But as a teenager, there were probably a few more bad days than there were good days, and I wasn't sure. But once, I, uh, but because I believed the Bible was God's word and it was plain and clear consistently throughout the Bible, it wasn't someone just picking a few verses and trying to beat me over the head uh, with those verses. We used to call people like that Bible bashers um, as Catholics. That was our, our term of endearment for our uh, evangelical uh, friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but it was there. It was on every page of the scriptures. God saves people who don't deserve it without their help. So from that day onward, once I once I accepted that and believed that Jesus had saved me, whether I was being good or not, and that I could trust in that completely, it meant that I knew my relationship with God had a future on a good day and on a bad day. And sometimes I describe it to my, my Catholic friends as a little bit like the difference between going out with someone and being married. Um, when you're going out with someone, you're not quite sure where the relationship's heading. On a good day, you think, yep, things have got a future. And on the bad days, you think, I'm not quite so sure. But um, I've been married to my wife, Deborah, now for just over 22 years. And I don't uh, wake up and worry about where that relationship is heading. On a good day, I know she loves me. And on a bad day, I know she loves me because she has to. She's promised. <laughs> so it gives me security in that relationship. And that's what understanding the gospel was like for me. It meant that I could live my life full on to Jesus um, and not be insecure about where I stood with him. So that's what I did. Um, I kept reading the Bible with my Protestant mates. I got more involved in the Catholic Church and ran a few different programs within the Catholic Church. Um, I was a leader within the Catholic Church. And at the same time, I went to Bible study with my Protestant mates at university. And then for about three or four years uh, after I left university in their homes, um, 
And they'd often talk to me and they'd say, oh, look, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, there are problems with the Catholic Church, um, you know, you, you shouldn't go. Um, and I generally discount them because they didn't really seem to understand Roman Catholicism. So I didn't feel that they had the right or the authority to um, to to uh, criticise it. Um, I loved going to the Catholic Church and sinfully, I think, um, I held on to um, my my Catholicism uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I had a lot to lose. Um, being the good Catholic boy gained me a lot of parental approval um, um, and love from my parents, and it was the most important thing for them. So for me to question or leave Roman Catholicism, um, uh, I knew it would have a big impact on them and it really needed to be something like um, their salvation was at stake for me to think about leaving the Catholic Church. But after about 10 years, God uh, finally got the better of me and my and my pride, um, and it was in the context of meeting a girl uh, who was Protestant and she was quite quite serious about uh, her faith and I, I was too and we worked out that if this relationship was going to have a future, we'd need to work out where we went to church together. Um, so for the first time in my life, I was invited to a Protestant church for their Sunday service. I've been reading the Bible with uh, my friends for about 10 years, but I can never remember them inviting me to church Early on, I might not have gone, but um, certainly towards the end, I, I would have. Um, maybe by that stage, they'd put me in the too hard basket. I don't know. But um, I went to the Protestant church for the first time, and it was amazing. There were hundreds of young people that were listening to the Bible being taught clearly, and they were actually hanging around afterwards and talking about what they were learning, talking about what they were doing with what they were learning about God and how it was affecting their lives. And something that was really strange that it's hard to explain, but when they got to the point in the service when they said the creed, you could tell that they actually meant it. They weren't just saying words. And and, and those things had a real impact on me and I faced a bit of a crisis. How could I take this girl that I really cared about out of a church that was, by you know, after 10 years of reading the Bible, doing what I could see was faithful to what God said church should be about and take her to my Catholic church that by this stage I was having some fairly serious questions about whether they were being faithful to God's teaching. So... Uh, I met up with actually the guy that asked me that first question to uh, 10 years earlier uh, about what I believed. He was now studying to be a minister at Moore Theological College and uh, I met up with him and I said, look, um, I want to know um, where the line is between um, uh, uh, Christianity and Roman Catholicism. Can we have a look at what the Catholic Church actually teaches? Can we have a look at the Vatican II documents, which at that stage were the most recent documents, comprehensive documents written by the Catholic Church on Catholic beliefs in the 20th century? Um, and uh, he said, yeah, we can look at some Vatican II documents, but I also want to have a look at the book of Galatians. Um, uh, he, he was a clever fella. And I said, oh, look, I love looking at the Bible. Very happy to read the book of Galatians. So we read the book of Galatians together and we looked at Vatican II, particularly um, a book called D.A. Verbum, which was one of their documents. And after four weeks of reading through that and the book of Galatians, I could see that it wasn't just a bad job at teaching the gospel that the Catholic Church was doing. Fundamentally, they were teaching a different gospel. And I don't know how well you know Paul's letter to Galatians, but he doesn't leave you with a lot of wriggle room. Uh, he says twice, actually, in the first chapter, anyone who teaches a gospel different to the gospel of Jesus is eternally condemned or anathema. And I couldn't sit on the fence anymore. I had to leave. Um, my mum cried for three days. I knew she would, um, and it was very difficult at home. 
Um, but at the same time, I started going to a church that was teaching the Bible clearly, and I was cared for and loved by people in a in a different way that, than what I was in the Catholic Church. I, I, I was I was deeply loved in the Catholic Church, but there was something about the character and the way that people in my church loved me that was was deeply attractive and better. Um, so uh, I kept going, and um, that uh, girl became my wife and uh, after a few years I considered um, leaving medicine and retraining a, as a minister with with the uh, goal of, of helping my Protestant mates um, um, yeah have great conversations with people from a Catholic background about Jesus and uh, I'm still doing that 20 years later. Mark thank you for your sharing your story testimonies are always uh, so powerful and personalize the gospel and, and hearing people um, tell about their experience and especially uh, for our purpose, someone coming out of uh, Roman Catholicism. <clears throat> I want to, of course, ask you about uh, what you've learned about how to take your experience, which has shaped you greatly, of course, and uh, share that with others and uh, share the gospel with people coming who are either in Roman Catholicism or out of Roman Catholicism. But something you said uh, during your testimony triggered a question in my mind. And I think it's extremely important as we think through the uh, current topic at hand. And, and that is how difficult it is for a Roman Catholic to leave the Roman Catholic church, especially when you take into consideration family members and uh, in your case, your mom and dad who had raised you Catholic and um, just how, what factor does that play in people's minds as people think about sharing the gospel with their with their Catholic uh, friends or family members. I mean, how strong is that playing as a, as a factor of thinking first about family before necessarily even the theological issues at stake? Yeah. Um, look, I think the most helpful thing is to just help your Catholic friend or person that you're conversing with or meeting with to understand the gospel and to start reading the scriptures and to start being discipled as they do that. Now, they may well keep going to the Catholic Church during that process if they're regular um, regular church attenders. If they're irregular church attenders, which most Catholics are, um, or even non-attenders, um, then that may not be so much of an issue. Sometimes they might actually become more committed Catholics once they hear the gospel because that's the way they think they should express their um, newfound understanding of the gospel. Um, I don't let that worry me too much. I'm more concerned about them understanding the gospel, learning how to read the Bible and being discipled. So, you know, I'll, I'll often um, just meet up weekly and, and read the Bible one-to-one with guys that are still going to the Catholic Church and calling them Catholic, and that can take years sometimes before they choose to leave. Um, sometimes I think perhaps converted people never leave the Catholic Church. I'm not sure if my mum's converted whether she would ever leave at, at, at 84 years of age. I think that might even be a bit too much for her, even if she um, yeah came to an understanding that there are that, that, that the Catholic Church is teaching a different gospel. So um, yeah, person by person, but focus on the things that are most important: the gospel, knowing how to read the scriptures, being discipled, and and that that process helps them to to think through or, or prioritize that over you know, a uh, family member, what they may think or, or, or yeah. whatnot, and just ingraining the gospel in, in their minds. Yeah, look, um, God's gentle and gracious, but sometimes he gives us a, a, a real wake-up call. Um, it's in his timing. Um, you, can't, you can't force someone to do something they're not ready for. So let, let the scriptures, let the gospel work in the heart of the person um, so that they might, um, yeah, um, come to an understanding that leaving the Catholic Church is probably the best thing for them to do. Right. I think you had a, you made a really strong point. And if, if someone is 
one of our listeners has an opportunity to sh- share with a family member and see some maybe positive steps, but then what they would perceive to be negative steps or returning, hearing the gospel and returning to the Catholic church. And it can be frustrating. Uh, but like you said, it's all in the Lord's timing and being patient and, and, uh, try not to get frustrated and know that Lord's at work praying for them. Um, but let's say, let's say one of, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying my mate that first, um, uh, I suppose, started to share the gospel with me, had to wait 10 years before I left. And interestingly, while I was in the Catholic Church, because I was enjoying my Bible studies with my Protestant mates, I started Bible studies in the Catholic Church, and I'd have 30 people a week in the Catholic Church reading the Bible with me. Um, yeah, so God uses um, uh, converted people in Catholic churches to do his work, even though sinfully I was holding on to the Catholic Church um, perhaps for longer than I should have. So, Mark, here's a here's a big question for you. Um, one of our listeners is has an opportunity at a family gathering or getting coffee with a Roman Catholic friend or a brother or sister or mother or dad and they're wondering to themselves, well, how do I bring up the gospel? What do I do? What do I say? How do I do this? And go about uh, sharing the gospel with them. What's your advice to them? Yeah. Um, sometimes you'll have conversations with with people um, and share the fact that you're, you're Christian. And uh, often a, um, a person from a Catholic background might go, oh, I'm, I'm Catholic, but we're all the same, really. Um, I, I hear that a lot from from uh, Catholic people that I make, uh, meet, uh, that, that sort of idea that Catholics and Protestants are, are, are basically the same. I, I don't know whether you guys are encountering that um, a, a bit as well, but the way I handle that one is I go, um, oh, that's interesting. Um, I, you know, tell me if I've got it right, but most Catholics I've met believe that good people go to heaven. And generally, in fact, universally, every Catholic that I've met will agree with that statement. And then I say, do you know most Protestants believe that only bad people go to heaven? That's a bit of a difference, isn't it? And have a bit of a laugh. Um, I think these days one of the barriers to talking with Catholics about Jesus is I think that Catholics and Protestants are basically the same. They're just a better version. And if they think like that, then they really don't think we've got a lot to offer them. And I think opening that door by saying, well, actually, we're a bit different. Why don't we, you know, explore those differences? I'm not saying that I'm right and you're wrong. I'm just saying that, you know, maybe we're not as similar as you think we are. Um, yeah, that's, that's I've, found, I've found a lot of fruit from that approach. What about us going back to this uh, this idea that, sharing the gospel with our, our Roman Catholic friends and family members is, is difficult. It's hard. Uh, it can be very discouraging. It takes a long time. Like you said, in your own personal story, uh, it was a 10 year process, but your, your friends were, were there when you needed them and they were faithful to sharing the gospel. Uh, what, what words of encouragement or advice would you have to, um, to people who are discouraged by the, the lack of fruit they've seen, or feel like they're just spinning their wheels and not, not seeing any fruit? What, 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 uh, yeah, how would you encourage them? Look, I would encourage you to just be, be faithful to, to Jesus' call to go and make disciples of all different sorts of people. And, you know, Catholic people are, uh, you know, are, are one of those groups. And to be, to be intentional about it. To, to think about them, to pray for them, to do things like listen to the podcast that, that um, you guys run so you can learn more about Roman Catholicism and have better chats with your Catholic friends about Jesus, to, to do have those conversations on the basis of knowledge rather than just um, presupposition. Um, it's, it's fascinating um, looking at uh, what, what is the biggest revival in human history, and that is um, the growth of the gospel in South America. Um, there's some very interesting work done by Ashley Knoll and Ed Smither um, where they've looked at um, this revival and they've traced the revival back to the decision by North American missionary agencies to see South America as a mission field. 
um, in the 1880s uh, when South America was about 97% Roman Catholic nominally, um, uh, the North Americans decided to treat it as a mission field. They thought there was a big enough problem there that they needed to send missionaries, they needed to plant churches, they needed to start theological training in South America. And they've traced it through from that decision to the present day to see how by doing that the the result has been tens tens of millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions of people in South America are now going to churches where the gospel's clearly explained, where the, the Bible's taught, and uh, and it's wonderful. So take the long-term view. Um, you know, you, you may only see small fruit today, but that intentionality um, you know, has the potential to, to bear enormous fruit um, over the longer term. So, uh, yeah, there's still a lot of barriers in helping Catholics to even hear the gospel um, and to hear it clearly. Um, and I think if we're faithful to Jesus' call to reach all different sorts of people, including people from a Roman Catholic background and intentional and prayerful, um, yeah, uh, God, God, God has a track record of, uh, of honouring our, um, our efforts uh, for his glory, which is, which is great. Um, Reed, there's two things that I found most helpful in getting my head around talking with Catholics about Jesus. Can, can I share share those with you? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Okay, great, mate. Um, look, the framework for Catholic evangelism and discipleship uh, has to be love, okay? Um, it, one of the barriers to speaking with Catholics about Jesus is that we live in a society where um, there are so many different beliefs, and those beliefs are very strongly held. Um, a pluralistic society where it's actually considered dangerous to the peace to be talking about differences in belief and even the possibility that someone's belief might be wrong. Um, so the way we cope with living with so many different religious groups around us tends to be indifference. We tend to avoid differences. Um, as I read the Bible, I don't find many passages encouraging us to be indifferent to our neighbour and lots of passages that call us to love our neighbour. We need to be good at loving people that think differently to us and it, there's a couple of things I think really help um, probably with all different sorts of people groups but um, I, I found this has really helped in my thinking about Roman Catholicism. The first key step to loving someone who thinks differently to us is to understand them, to understand how they think, to understand how the world makes sense to them. And one of the things that I'm really thankful to the Rome Scholars and Leaders Network uh, for is that they've sort of raised the issue of the fact that often as Protestants we list the things that we agree with with Roman Catholicism and the things that we disagree with Roman Catholicism in and we, we tend to sort of um, try and have conversations ab about the differences but we don't seem to understand how Roman Catholicism makes sense uh, holistically to Catholics. So how does their understanding of Mary affect what they think about church and why they go to church? And how does their understanding of church uh, relate to what they think the Pope is and what he does? And how does uh, that affect the way that they understand the sacraments and how you get to heaven? So by understanding how all the bits of Roman Catholicism fit together or Roman Catholic worldview, um, it helps us to love, love Catholics better, um, to think of their religion holistically or systematically rather than just points that we agree with and disagree with. We wouldn't like it if people, you know, just thought um, that the bits that we believe weren't connected, like our understanding of the Trinity had no bearing on the place and work of uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures and how our understanding of the Bible relates to our understanding of Jesus and salvation and church. Um, our religious system functions together holistically, but surprise, surprise, so, so does the Roman Catholic system. So help, help understanding how they think and how Catholic worldview 
operates uh, is, is a really helpful and loving thing to do. And then the second thing I find that's really helpful um, is to go to them, to meet them where they're at. That's what mission is, isn't it? It's going out. Um, and it's it's what God's done for us. He, he doesn't expect us to think our way to him. He meets us where we're at as sinful human beings by sending his son uh, in human likeness to redeem us from our sin on the cross and bring us graciously into relationship with him. And when you look at the ministry of Jesus, you see Jesus meeting the people that uh, he's trying to reach by going out to them. He meets the tax collectors at the tax booths, um, the religious leaders in their synagogues, um, the the um, fishermen at their fishing nets, the prostitutes in the streets, um, the criminals on the cross. Um, and the Apostle Paul also embodies that way and talks about that way of doing ministry. He talks about being like the Jews to win the Jews and like the Greeks to win the Greeks. And he, he tells us, um, in Philippians 2, that we should have that attitude too. Um, you know, humbly consider others more significant than ourselves and look not only to our own interests but also the interests of others. Um, so meeting Catholics where they're at rather than expecting them to think like us straight away is the second thing that I found really helpful. And the penny dropped for me when I was writing a book to um uh, reach Catholics. And I thought a good place to start would be to write, read the sort of books that Catholics reach to evangelise Protestants. There's actually quite a lot of material out there that, um, that Roman Catholics write to try and convince um, Protestants that Catholicism is the way to go. In fact, there's probably more of that sort of material than there is of material of Protestants trying to reach Catholics. So um, I, I looked at some of the stuff and it, it was fascinating. And I also looked at the things that other um, evangelicals uh, had written to reach Catholics. And a lot of the evangelical material was careful arguments from the scriptures about why the Protestant position is right and why the Catholic position is wrong. And a lot of the Catholic material was much more experiential uh, or testimony-based. It was, I used to be Protestant and then uh, something happened. It might be a miracle in my life or um, I walked into a Catholic church or whatever it may be and I became Catholic and my life became so much better. Now, as a Protestant, uh, you'd be pleased to know that I'm much more uh, likely to be persuaded by careful arguments from scriptures about what's right and wrong. But as a Catholic, I was much more likely to be persuaded by people's religious experiences and, and what had happened in their lives um, to, uh, to be convinced of and to continue as a Catholic. Um, but as we're trying to write to our audience, shouldn't we be writing in a way that makes sense and is persuasive for the people that we're trying to reach. So um, some Catholics do this very well. They argue from the scriptures quite persuasively sometimes about why they think the Catholic position is right and the Protestant position is wrong, and I'm more likely to be persuaded by that. But how about us as Protestants speaking into that Catholic worldview with more understanding um, and in a way that might captivate and be clearer for the Catholic people that we're trying to reach. So I had a go at that. Um, I got together a book of testimonies of people that used to be Catholic who heard the gospel and started, uh, got converted and uh, started um, uh, growing through their knowledge and love of Jesus in the Bible. Um, and uh, I've had lots of people give that book to people from a Catholic background and it have a, a, a good effect on um, helping someone from a Catholic church um, to think through these things and, and even leave the Catholic church. So um, that's what I, one of the things I try and help to communicate um, when speaking to my Protestant friends. Understand how Catholics think and then shape your ministry to try and um, reach them where they're at. And I've got a few uh, simple uh, tips uh, in order to, to, to do that. Um, have we got, we've got time for that? Absolutely. 
Right, three things. Good talk always has three points, doesn't it? Um, three things that are based on how Catholics think and particularly how Catholics think about God. Um, one of the most important things for Roman Catholicism is unity. Um, yeah, the Catholic Church believes that its role is to unify the whole world um, under its organisation, under God. Um, so the way that um, the Catholic Church believes people are saved is by joining or being linked to the Roman Catholic Church. So belonging is an incredibly important um, ideal for Catholics. They believe that they're saved by belonging to the Catholic Church. Okay, so that's that's um, the first way that Catholics know God is by belonging. Um, the second thing that's really important for Catholics um, is their their experience. Um, it it has to do with the way that they understand or think that God operates in the world, and and they believe that the the world unredeemed um, is capable of receiving God's grace and transmitting that grace. It's how they kind of understand the sacraments. But the, the bottom line is that Catholics are looking to their experiences in this world to know God clearly and truly. Uh, so that's the second, second big idea. Uh, Catholics know God by belonging. Catholics know God through their experiences and particularly their religious experiences. The third um, major way that Catholics know God is through the hierarchy. Um, the Catholic Church is a very hierarchically ordered system. They, they essentially believe that they're the continuation of Christ in the world. And by your relationship to that hierarchy and as you move up that hierarchy, you get closer to God. So Catholics are always looking to an authority, whether that be the priest or the pope or saint, someone higher up in the hierarchy or Mary um, in order to be able to relate more closely to God. So as Protestants, uh, those concepts are not completely foreign to us but not what we would say were the most important uh, ways for us to know and relate to God. Um, but when we realise these things, that belonging is really important to Catholics, that uh, their experience is really important, um, particularly their religious experience, and that the hierarchy um, or the authority uh, figures are really important to them. Um, and we have the attitude of meeting them where they are at rather than expecting them to think like us straight away, well, we can start to shape our ministries to... to um, to um, take account of those things. Ministries that invite Catholics to belong to things, whether it's belonging to relationship, belonging within your family, belonging to your small group or belonging to your church, regardless of whether they think of themselves as Catholic or not, um, can be a very powerful way for them to start to hear the gospel more clearly and respond to it. So uh, inviting Catholics to belong to things uh, is really important. Even just inviting a Catholic mate to belong to a sporting team or a club that you're part of brings them closer. Um, no longer is it Catholic versus Protestant. It's two friends that belong together. And in that context, often it's a lot easier to share the gospel. They're more likely to trust you and they're more likely to learn from you. So inviting Catholics to belong to things is a really important and helpful thing. As I said, Catholics are big on experience and they look to their sacraments and their religious experiences as a way of truly knowing God. Now, we as Protestants all have a religious experience um, uh, that's very important as well, don't we? Uh, we call it our testimony or what it's like to live as a follower of Jesus in his world. And sharing those experiences with Catholics can be really powerful. Sharing your testimony with Catholic people can be really helpful for Catholics because it's speaking into their worldview, hence that book of testimonies I put together. Um, you know, sharing your own testimony, sharing your experience inviting them to church and seeing what it's like to go to a Protestant church. Um, most Catholics have never been to one. 
They used to be excommunicated if they walked even um, past the front gate until about 30 years ago. So um, many Catholics have never been to a Protestant church except to maybe a funeral or a wedding. So letting them experience what church is like for you can be really powerful. Um, conventions and conferences also, um, music, um, even, even prayer nights um, can really have a, a significant effect on Catholics and help them to receive and understand the gospel. So um, sharing your experience with is, experiences with Catholics is really important. And then the last one is authority is really important for Catholics, and you know, that's a good thing. We recognise an authority too. We don't, we're not gods unto ourselves. We recognise that we need to humbly come before God by recognising that the scriptures are his word and they're true and we need to submit to them. Um, And Catholics believe that too. They just don't know how to read their Bibles. It's not part of their culture. So showing Catholics how to read the Bible can often help them substitute their uh, authority um, from the priest to Jesus through his spirit directly in his word. And that can be a really liberating thing for Catholics as they start to hear Jesus speak to them directly through the Bible and not having to go through the priest um, by learning how to read the Bible for themselves. There's some great tools around that I feel really find really helpful um, in helping Catholics to start reading the Bible. Uh, Some of the work by Richard Begonnen um, using um, William Taylor's sermon notes on the Gospel of John. Um, it's a publication called The Word One to One, where there's lots of little booklets that you can just sit down with your Catholic mate and uh, and read the Bible together. Um, that's that's what I try and do the most. Um, or inductive Bible reading methods, um, the Swedish method. You can Google the Swedish method uh, if you haven't heard of it and get a really helpful uh, way of not just telling people what the Bible says but showing them how to find that out for themselves. That, That can be really powerful. So three simple things that take account of how Catholics think about God Um, You know, they're big on belonging, so invite them to belong to stuff. They're big on their religious experiences, so share your experience with them. And they're big on authority, so show them how to read the Bible so that that can become their ultimate authority that they trust for all things. Um, Yeah, invite, share, show. Not that hard. (laughs) No, Well, thank you so much, Mark. That's incredibly helpful. And if there's one key word that stands out here, it's the intentionality and all of these things and patience. And as you said, it needs to be rooted in love and understanding. Uh, So thank you so much for that. In fact, I I recall a lot of these things that you've just shared with our listeners from uh, participating in the Rome Scholars and Leaders Network. And in fact, I remember uh, at one point there was um, a question, if I only had 30 seconds to share with uh, Roman Catholic, what it is we believe, how would I approach that? And you mentioned it previously in this episode. It's, it's that difference of Catholics believe that heaven is where good people go. Protestants believe that it's where bad people go uh, in order to um, address that stark difference on how we are justified and made right before God. So thank you so much for that. Um, if we could ask you to share briefly uh, about your resources and, um, for, for example, your books and where people might go if they want to find other resources and articles by you and learn more about your ministry. Sure. Um, so the resources that uh, I've written are really for Catholic people. So um, you know, often when you buy a Christian book, you're buying it to edify yourself. Um, these resources are really resources to give to someone else. So you've got to kind of get that in your mind first. Um, there, there are three things that um, uh, I've produced. One is just a set of five small Bible studies that you can do with your Catholic friend that help them to understand the gospel in a way that makes sense to them. It doesn't use the word Catholic at all. I don't think Catholics often are that responsive to the idea that we want to um, share the gospel with them because they think they're Christian already. Um, but this set of studies is a set of studies um, called The God Who Saves, and it, it just explains the gospel in a way that's intentional for, for Catholics and how they think. 
Um, the second book I've mentioned a couple of times is uh, the uh, is Stepping Out in Faith, and that's a collection of uh, testimonies. Uh, some of you North American readers may know Matt Schmucker. His testimonies in there. I've tried to collect testimonies of converted Roman Catholics from around the world, so that uh, various Catholic people can connect with someone and uh, through their experiences hear the gospel. And then the third uh, third resource is something called The Road Once Travelled. And it's written for Catholics that are getting jaded or frustrated with the Catholic Church. And what it says is, look, those frustrations that you're having uh, are, are okay to have. The answer to those frustrations are Jesus. So a lot of Catholics get frustrated with the leadership, not uh, living up to their expectations, and the book basically gently says, well, Jesus is the leader that you're looking for. Human leaders will always let you down. Um, they, the, the other frustration that a lot of Catholics uh, uh, often feel is uh, a, a continued feeling of guilt, and it, it explains how um, Jesus completely removes our guilt by what he's done for us on the cross. So the answer to your feelings of guilt is Jesus. And then the third frustration Catholics often feel is a, um, a sense that their religion doesn't connect very well with their day-to-day life. And it sort of, again, points to Jesus and says that he makes everything relevant. Um, understanding Jesus is relevant to everything that we do. And it doesn't tell them to leave the Catholic Church. It just tells them to find someone and read the Bible with them. So it's just a gentle um, gentle way to yeah, help Catholics to start heading uh, heading towards the gospel and um, yeah, hearing the gospel and putting their faith in in Jesus alone. So yeah, you can get them through Christ Media, and in the UK, I think the Word um, is the organisation that um, that sells those resources. Um, and um, yeah, other things that I write through the Rome Scholars Network, and uh, you can also access some of my um, written material through Matthias Media and some of their publications and also through the Department of Evangelism and New Churches in Sydney, Australia. They've got a website with some of my things uh, on it as well. That's great. We'll make sure that we post a link to those resources and describe those resources in the episode notes for this podcast. So again, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think it was a very, very helpful conversation um, that will certainly bless our listeners. And I think you gave some great practical advice for them as well. Uh, So thank you for joining us. Pleasure, uh, Clay. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much. No worries, Reid. Thank you. And we hope to see you at the next uh, Rome Scholars and Leaders Network here in Rome. We look forward to that, having a cafe together, sharing a good plate of pasta, a good pizza together once again. Uh, Won't it be wonderful to see people again face-to-face? Amen. Amen to that. Well, for our listeners, as usual, I just want to remind you where you can find resources from the Reformanda Initiative. You can go to our site at www.reformandainitiative.org. You can find Leo's monthly article that uh, analyzes and discusses um, modern Roman Catholicism from an evangelical perspective at thevaticanfiles.org. And you can also find us on social media on Twitter at Reformanda Rome and on Facebook at Reformanda Initiative. Share our podcast, leave us a good review, and uh, we'll be praying for all of you. If you found this episode particularly helpful, please send us a message through the contact form on our website. We'd love to hear about that. Uh, we'll pass those uh, thoughts and comments along to Mark. So until next time from Rome, God bless. Mm-hmm.